We're recording and we're live. Um, good evening, everyone. And again, welcome to another Beyond Access series. Uh, we're so happy to have you all here with us tonight uh, in our part two session of literacy. And we're so happy to welcome back Lavinia Mancuso from Everyone Reading uh, to share with you all some more tips, tricks, and strategies to teach reading at home. Uh, we, we're excited. We're going to go get right into it. Tonight, as every night, you're able to ask your questions using the Q&A feature. So feel free to type in those questions. We'll be answering questions as they come along. And then we'll be setting aside some time to ask some of the most frequent questions to Lavinia towards the end. Um, and uh, throughout the session, Lavinia is going to giving, be giving you all some prompts. And I'm going to help and stand in the seat of student. <laughs> and. Uh, and you'll be hearing me making uh, whatever sounds or noises or answering whatever prompts Lavinia asks. So without much further ado, let's get into it. Lavinia, good evening. Welcome back to the Beyond Access series. Well, I am delighted to be back. And I hope you can see, oh, there I am. Uh, I'm delighted to be back. And um, today is a real snow day. Yesterday was a snow day. And I keep urging parents to just talk to their children. Talk, the best things you can do for your children are free. Free play and conversation. And snow provides both of those activities. You can run and jump and throw snowballs. And you can also talk about science. You can talk about feelings. You can talk about lots of things related to snow and playing in the snow. Now, I have heard that you can tell a person's age by their response to snow, that kids run into the snow and throw themselves into it. I don't see too many adults doing that. They think about shoveling and, you know, you know what you think about with snow, but try to get into it with your children because it's a great opportunity for oral language development and exercise. So as usual, I am going to be very simple. I was a first grade teacher. And so I'm going to show you a lot of the things that I did in first when I was a first grade teacher and a second grade teacher. Uh, first of all, I do not want you to buy anything. Everyone is trying to get you to buy things. Don't. The simplest things are the best. You know that your kids love to play with the boxes more than the stuff inside. And it's the same with listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Let's keep it simple. If you really want to buy something, I would recommend that you buy colored pens because kids love to write with colored pens. Uh, and they can't erase, so they can't waste time and they can't make holes in their paper. So that's something I would recommend. You don't have to buy any special paper, writing paper, no, a loose leaf or a little 59 cent notebook or a legal pad, all good. So don't go out spending lots of money. And most of the activities that I'm going to be demonstrating can be found on the internet. Just look up the topic and you'll find lots of things. And um, so I think that's very important that you really don't have to buy anything. Listening, speaking, reading and writing are part of what we can do. And they've been teaching those things for millennia. Even before smart boards, even before cell phones, people learned to listen. You don't have to learn to listen and speak but people have been learning to read and write. So let's keep it simple. So I am going to share the screen and go to my PowerPoint, which is here. And can you see it? Yes, we can see it. I don't know if uh, you're not in full screen mode yet though. Okay, so what should I do? Uh, go here. from at the top left, click on uh, from beginning. Ah, cool. And slideshow. Okay, am one, I in full screen Try that screen one more now? time. There you are. There we are. 
Okay. Oh, this is not the beginning. So I have to go back to uh, the beginning. This is the easiest way to do it. <laughs> okay. Last time, if you were here, we did the beginning, the very basics of what you should know about reading in English. Today, we're getting a little bit more sophisticated. We're going to explore the simple view of reading, which means a lot of decoding. And let's think about decoding. And let's think about reading and writing. Like any important skill, reading and writing have to be taught. You don't just read and write. Uh, there are a lot of people in this world who don't read and write because they haven't been taught. And like any important skill, reading and writing have to be practiced constantly. The more you practice, the better you get, the more automatic you get. And then at some point, you barely have to even think about what you're doing. And then you can really be creative. And let's think about these people, Mozart, Michelangelo, Serena Williams. They're very good at what they do or what they did. They had very good teachers and they practiced a lot. They didn't just all of a sudden start composing, all of a sudden start, you know, painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. She didn't start winning tournaments. And Serena still practices every single day for many hours to be at the top of her game. Okay, so we have to get kids to practice, we have to teach them, and then we have to get them to practice. Like brushing your teeth, you have to practice it. Now, one of the things I've been thinking about recently is a suicide. Uh, Anita Archer, the famous reading specialist, talks about that. That we assume kids know what they don't know, or we assume that they don't know what they do know. So we have to be careful about that. So you would never just all of a sudden tell your child, ah, brush your teeth. You would teach them and keep practicing with them and keep bothering them. And we always tell kids to pay attention. Now, paying attention is a very abstract concept. How do you pay attention? And I will tell you, I had an experience last week. We have a little tutoring program and one very sweet, engaged little girl uh, it was great when we were just teaching sounds and words, but now the kids are reading sentences and stories and uh, the teacher says, pay attention. And this wonderful little girl was playing with her hair and obviously not paying attention. And since she was such a great kid, the teacher took a few minutes and a few seconds and said, you know, this is how you pay attention. You sit up straight, you listen to the person who is reading, you follow along on your worksheet, and if you have to, you use your finger to follow along. And the little girl said, oh, and she's been paying attention ever since because the teacher taught her what she expected her to do when she said, pay attention. All right, last time we talked about the simple view of reading. And the simple view of reading has two major components. Decoding the language, making a connection between the sounds and syllables and the sounds and letters and the sounds and letters as they form into words. And language comprehension is having a big vocabulary, having a lot of experiences so you have prior knowledge, being able to manipulate words. So basically, the school can take care of the decoding, but parents really can help a lot with the language comprehension, just by talking and listening to your children. That is the most powerful thing you can do. And we had a, a major conference uh, where under, we have it going on. And the greats of reading, the big names in literacy are all saying reading starts with speech. 
And the best thing you can do for your children is to talk with them and listen to them and, uh, you know, develop that oral language that when they learn how to do the decoding, they'll be way ahead. Okay, we're talking about decoding. Every language is a code. When you sit on the subway and someone next to you uh, is speaking, even you know when you're close together, speaking a language that you have no idea what it is, you cannot figure out that code. Basically, I am making sounds. Sounds are coming out of my mouth. It is your responsibility as the listener to make sense of the sounds that are coming out of my mouth. Now, if you don't understand English, you probably will not be able to make sense of the sounds that are coming out of my mouth. And if you talk to me in Arabic, I will never be able to understand the sounds that come out of your mouth unless I study it for 10 or 20 years. So let we always have to think of language as being a code that we want kids to break both orally and in reading and writing. So here's a code that no one has broken. These are Inca Kipos. This is a book of some sort. It could be a ledger or a history. And these look very beautiful, but they are knots. And it was read, some knots are bigger, some knots are more widely spaced. But this was uh, the way the Inca transmitted information. Obviously, it drove the Spaniards crazy when they arrived because they were used to a very simple alphabetic language. And this was not for them. We also have other codes that we're familiar with. The numeral system, the numbering system. All of these numerals stands for a quantity. And so this is a code. These musical notes st stand for different sounds. And so these are other codes that we have to help kids break if we want. I mean, they must break the numeric code. Uh, I would love everybody to break the musical code as well. Uh, we'll talk about music as a wonderful way of getting kids to, uh, to read. Believe it or not, there's research on that. Not necessarily the notes, but tuning up their ears. Okay, so here we have different languages, different codes. And if you speak another language at home, be, be sure to tell the school people, the pediatrician, anyone who would listen that your child speaks another language because sometimes things can be misinterpreted. Uh, my friend was in a fury because the pediatrician had said to her daughter that her marvelous grandson did not have enough words. Well, the truth is the kid had plenty of words, but they happened to be in Cambodian because his primary caregiver, 45 hours a week, was his father's aunt who only spoke Cambodian. So the parents were in a panic and they put the child in an English only daycare center. And so that solved the word, the English word problem. Uh, but the child did not have the opportunity to become bilingual. And these are choices that you have to make. I can't advise you on this, but um, if you choose to speak another language at home, let the school know so they don't say, oh, he doesn't have enough words. The words may be in another language. So this is what we talked about last time. All languages have certain characteristics. Everybody listens and everybody speaks. That seems to be built in our DNA. Unless a child has a serious impairment, they will learn to listen and to speak. However, Reading and writing are not built into our DNA and they must be taught explicitly. And then we also have something that's very important. 
the silent language. Kids have to be able to interpret facial expressions and hand signals. And sometimes the ones that they understand at home are not necessarily the same as the ones in school. So <clears throat> this is the progression of language from speech to print. So little children, babies, are constantly listening. And babies start by looking at people's eyes. But then at about five to six months, they start looking at people's mouths because they want to know what is going on making all those sounds. And they also want to tune in to the sounds that are around them. But they're not talking just yet. They're just absorbing all of that. And then they start to talk. But they don't start to talk in paragraphs. They start to talk in words. They're labeling mom, mama, uh, table, food, cereal, television. And then they talk in phrases. And then they talk in sentences. And then before you know it, they are driving you crazy because they're talking and talking and talking and talking. And then so they've gotten to the level of expressive fluency. And that's where we want everyone to get. Now, when they get to it, the same process has to go on with reading and writing. You don't start by writing, writing the great American novel. You start by writing words, not even writing words, writing down sounds, then writing words, then writing sentences and phrases. And then all of a sudden, if this goes right and you have good instruction and you have good oral language, you're writing paragraphs. But this takes time and it takes instruction. So the first thing we're going to talk about is speech. And the most important thing that research, I know it sounds counterintuitive, but research tells us that the most important thing that beginning readers have to know is phonological awareness. They have to be able to hear and say and manipulate the sounds. And so we're going to have a little exercise and little Jose is going to be my student. So I am going to stop sharing so that you can see my mouth. And so Jose will chime in from wherever he is. All right, on your, on, I'm going to tell you this, it's on the PowerPoint. We're going to do blending, we're going to do segmenting, we're going to do deleting, adding, and substituting. And I hope you can do this along with Jose. He'll be shouting out from wherever. Okay, blending means that you can take isolated sounds and put them together into words. So I'm going to tell you four sounds, four sounds, and you are going to put them into a word. These are the four sounds. L, A, P. Clap. Clap, right. Now, sometimes it's hard for kids to say it out loud. It may be easier for them to say it inside their mouths, like, and get it that way. Okay, now we're getting to segmenting. This is a fancy word for just taking words apart. So we're going to take away apart the word flip. Flip has four sounds, flip. Can you separate those four sounds? Let's see how Jose, how Jose does. Jose, flip. What have you got? Uh, right. A lot of kids will say if they won't hear or they won't say the second sound. So you have to really work on that. Now we're going to do this with a word. Insurance. 
There are three syllables, three parts in insurance. You can sound them out every time your chin goes down, there's another part. So here we go, insurance. Jose, what have you got? Insurance. Perfect. All right, now we're going to do deleting. Deleting simply means taking, piece, taking sounds away. Now you notice we're not writing anything. Jose is not writing anything. I'm not showing you anything. This is phonological awareness. It's all auditory. And that's where reading starts. Okay, Jose, we're deleting. We're taking things away. So say the word flap. Flap. Okay, Jose, say the word flap, but take away the f. Lap. Perfect. Lap. Okay, Jose, say the word flit. Flit. Okay, say flit again, but take away t. Fli. Fli. Now, this is not a word, but it is part of many words like flimsy and flipper and things like that. So uh, you, these don't always have to be words because syllables fit into other words. Okay, we're going back to words. Okay, Jose, say insurance again. Insurance. Now say insurance again, but don't say ants. Insure. Perfect. Now say paradise. Paradise. Say paradise again, but don't say dice. Para. Para. If you do this with children, unless you give them a lot of practice, they will usually not hear and say the middle syllable. So a lot of times with kids, you say paradise, take away the dice, and they say par. So training them to hear all the syllables is very important because when they get to reading, you want them to spell all the syllables. Okay, <clears throat> then adding. That's just putting on sounds. And remember, we're not doing anything with letter names. For phonological awareness, for phonics, we get rid of letter names, letter pictures, all of that. It's just sound symbol correspondence. So here we are with the sounds. Okay, we're adding Jose. Say clap. Clap. Okay, say clap again, but add a s at the end. Claps. Okay, good. Claps. I hope everybody out there is doing it with us. I mean, Jose is not my only student, right? Say love. Love. Say love again and put a d on the end. Loved. Good. Now say mart. Mart. Say mart again, but put a s at the beginning. Marts. Smart. That is very smart. Okay, now this is the hardest part. Substituting. When you take out a sound and you put another one in. Here we go. Okay, Jose, say clap. Clap. Good. Say clap again, but take out the ah and put in an i. Clip. Yes. Tricky. Okay. Now say rock. Rock. Say rock again, but take away the r and put in a s. Sock. Sock. Perfect. Now say the word bin. Bin. Say bin again, but take out the n and put in a t. Bit. Bit. Jose is an A plus student. I hope you are all doing that. Now, you don't have to make these up. 
These are all on the internet. Uh, you can look up phonological awareness and you'll get piles of these little drills. And also on YouTube, you can watch David A. Kilpatrick do what I just did, only much better. Uh, and I'll put that in the chat, David A. Kilpatrick. Okay, so we're going back to my PowerPoint. Here we go. I'm hoping it works. Yes. <sighs> okay, so we did phonological awareness and Jose pulled that off with great panache. And now we're going into phonics. Hopefully I can move this. Hmm, what's happening? Any suggestions on how I can make this move? You might just need to click right. on it. Try clicking on it. Yeah. All right. Oh, uh, there you go. There it is. Uh, OK. There we go. So we're going into from phonological awareness to phonics. And everybody talks that there's some sort of difference between phonics and sight words. No. <laughs> There are only two or maybe a few other words in English that are completely not decodable. I and one. And if you can find some others, let me know. So all reading instruction should start with decoding after the kids can hear and say and manipulate the sounds or at the same time. So the, what sight words are, and this is the new research, sight words are words that you know how to decode, that you've practiced decoding, and that you've been taught. And you cannot go through life decoding all the words in a sentence. Can you imagine if I did start with decoding? I'd never get finished and I'd, I wouldn't know what was going on in that sentence. So as soon as kids know how to decode words, that it, it's very important that they stop decoding them and, and, uh, and recognize them by sight. And that you do, we're gonna talk about fluency and how to get to fluency and speed. But always, always, always remember that print is a transcription of speech. If you can say it, you can write it. If you can read it, it should come back to being something you say. All right, we did this before, but I want to remind you, English is an alphabetic language. We only have 26 letters and we only have 44 different sounds, that's it. So all the phonics programs in this country have to deal with the same old 26 letters and 44 sounds. So they're not all that different. Some of them have pictures, which I hate, and some of them make a big deal of letter names uh, and clue words. Basically, you wanna get to the sound. That helps you read not the picture, the sound. So we're going to practice these sounds and we'll do this all together. Jose may want to chime along or he may be tired from his exertions. All together, ah, ah. B, B, K, K, D, D, eh, eh, G, G, I, I, J, J, K, K, O, O, M, M, N, N, A, A, P, P. That was very good. That's what I want to point out. It, the P says, it doesn't say P. P is a word. P is a syllable. Uh, you don't, 
you want to pop that qua qua r uh -huh. Uh, uh, v, v, w, w, x, x, yeah, yeah, z, z. So remember, you have to keep everything very crisp. B, d. And now we have some combinations that kids have to recognize on site. Although sometimes they um, are not together, but most of the time they're together. Again, quick. Now, a lot of kids have trouble with th or th. It has two sounds. Just tell them to stick out their tongues and they will get it absolutely right. Stick out your tongue, Jose. Good. Wah. Wah. Now, you see, Jose has that Midwestern pronunciation where he says, oh, there's a little in the beginning. But in New York and uh, Queens, where I grew up, we just say, Whoa. and then usually in combinations, the vowels say their sounds. So these, when they're followed by an E with a consonant or something in between, they say A, A, E, E, I, I, O, O, U, U, and then we have ow and aw and all of those other combinations. But what usually happens as kids become more familiar with phonics and with applying letters to sounds, it gets much easier. It's funny, they have a harder time with ah than they have with aw and ow because they're really, by that time, they're really tuned in. So it's a very interesting thing. And then eventually the light bulb goes on and they're good to go. And that's where we want them to be. Okay, a lot of you have asked about pencil grip and penmanship, phonics and penmanship. Now, I was a first grade teacher, so this was what I did. Now, it's not always done. And just last Saturday, an occupational therapist was giving a lecture on just these things. And the reason she gave for being such a dragon about pencil grip and sitting up straight is because if you have good habits, you will not get tired. You will be able to write a lot. Whereas if you're slouching, you get tired. If you're holding the pencil the wrong way, you cannot write a whole lot. So I'm going to uh, unshare my screen again and show you the proper pencil grip. Now, <clears throat> Sometimes kids are forced to write in pre-K or when it's too early and they cannot actually do it. So they start holding the pencil like this. Do not let them continue. You cannot write the great American novel like this. You cannot write the answers to an essay question like this. So this is the proper pencil grip for a right-handed person. Again, you can look up pencil grips for left-handed people on the internet. But here we are. So two fingers down almost at the end of the paint, two fingers, and then you put one finger on top. And that's it. 
Now, what else have we got there? Because I can't see uh, my screen there. Then we have uh, posture. I tell, I tell kids, you sit up like George Washington when he was signing the Declaration of Independence. Good posture, because if you're lying down, you cannot uh, sustain your writing. And I am looking for my PowerPoint so I can keep going here. Anyway, what's the next thing on the PowerPoint? Uh, then we have to teach children that you go in English, not in Hebrew, not in Arabic, not in, uh, in Mandarin, but in English, we always go from left to right. You start on this side of the paper and you usually start at the top and usually lines paper has a margin line. And so you start at the margin line and you march all the way across. And then when you get to the end, you go back to the margin line. And then you keep doing that Z forever. That's the way we write in English. Now, I, with little kids, if they don't know that, I mean, when I was a first grade teacher, there were kids who got to the end of the line and wrote down the side. That is perfectly understandable because obviously I was not as precise as I should have been and I was committing a suicide. And we never want to do that. So I'm going to unshare my screen if I can figure out how to do that. No, I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, okay. Then we want to make sure that, that tall letters are tall and short letters are short. And also when kids are taught to write too early, they usually don't do this thing. So we want tall letters like B to be tall and a short letter like A to be half a space. You can see this. Tall letters are tall, short letters are short. And we have to teach kids to put a finger space between each word. That's a courtesy to the reader to, to know where the words begin and end. And frankly, good penmanship is a courtesy to the reader. It also, if we teach kids, remember we have to teach them and we have to give them lots and lots of practice and reminders. Don't forget to put spaces between your words. Don't sit up like George Washington. Hold the pencil. Also, one hand holds the pencil and one hand holds the paper. And I'm sure you've seen kids who are writing and the paper is going in six different directions. So let's move on. All right, how to print letters. I got this right off the internet. You can do that too. Here is a sample and it tells you where to begin and what to do. So with the capital A, you go down and then you go down the other way, then you put the line across. With the lowercase a, you start on the side, you go all around and then you go down. And so this is a very useful little thing, totally free, totally from the internet. Now, another important thing, and I am going to stop the share for a minute, uh, is making the letters without picking up your pencil. A lot of kids have troubles different have trouble differentiating between B's and D's. And so the way to do that is an the occupational therapist told me that what I, she said, she confirmed that what I was doing back in the stone age was the right thing. Uh, that you should say the sound as you write it. 
So I'm doing this down, up to the middle, around, <laughs> down, up to the middle, around, <laughs> down, up to the middle, around, <laughs> writing and saying it. And I did not pick up my pencil. So when it comes time to write the D, which is not today, maybe next week, the D is completely different. In tennis, it's like a forehand and a backhand. With the D, you start with the circle, you go up and down. Never pick up your pencil. Start with the circle, go up and down. Because what happens when you pick up your pencil, I see kids do this. Here, they have this line. What am I gonna do with this line? Do I put the circle on this side? Do I put the circle on that side? Do I even connect it? I see kids who write a B like this. No good. So we have to eliminate that fast and just teach them to write the letters without picking up their pencil. The same with the P, the P, and get rid of the letter names as soon as possible. You want kids to focus on sounds. So down, up, and around. P. Down, up, and around. P. Okay, so that's it for penmanship. And I mean, if your kids have good penmanship, encourage them. If they don't, this is a wonderful, you know, uh, thing to do when you're in a lockdown. And kids really like to have good penmanship. It's, you know, it's not a struggle. They'll be happy if, uh, if they learn to write correctly. Here are some things that I used to do in first grade because that was a long time ago and we had no money. Oh, it's almost time for me to stop. So I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to go very quickly into fluency. Uh, get a piece, cut a piece out of a magazine or a newspaper and say, hey, we're going to look for all the b all the bees today and just circle the bees with your colored pen. They love to do this and you're reinforcing the b. And another thing is to make some simple flashcards. And here's a little game. Okay, okay, Jose, is this a book? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, right. Okay, Jose, which one is a book? The one on now, my left. my class, you would point to this one. Then, okay, this is pretty, pretty clear, but then the next, time when the which one is a b? uh the first one the first one yes and then the final thing well you can if you have a lot of flashcards you put them out and you say find the book find the d, find the mm, find the o but the last one is jose what is this sound b. perfect so that's a simple uh, a simple phonics game. I am going to share the screen again and whip through fluency. And then questions. Okay, these are just things for you to remember. 95% of print is lowercase. So reserve those capitals for the beginning of a sentence and names. And Kids, I mean, this is this is our code. And the kids have to just, the way to learn our code is just to have repetition. Did you remember your capital? Did you remember your periods? Uh, a lot of um, young people I know now are writing all in caps. I mean, I don't know whether the school will allow that, but if they don't allow it, you really have to be careful that the kids are not putting capitals in the middle of a sentence or in the middle of a word because they will be misjudged. Uh, the importance of fluent writing and keyboarding. You cannot, if you 
are struggling to remember which way a bee goes, you cannot write creatively. If you are trying to type a term paper with your thumbs, you cannot write creatively. We have to get these mechanical skills under control. So they're automatic. Keyboarding, and you can get keyboarding programs, uh, not for little kids, but certainly uh, in middle and high school, kids have to be able to keyboard. And then another thing that is very important is for kids to see uh, the same letter in different fonts. That's why it's good to give them like, you know, newspapers, magazines, and they'll see all the different ways that you can write uh, the same letter. Okay, we're just gonna do this quickly, sounding out words. Now we see what Jose did with his ears. Let's attach print to it. Everybody together? Ah, mm. Put it together. What have you got, Jose? He has pen, I know he does. Anyway, again, he could do it inside his mouth if that's easier. Now, here we have pen, very simple. But if you're speaking Spanish, it's bread. If you are speaking English, it's a skillet, or it could be Peter Pan, or it could be criticizing a, theater, a theatrical production, or it could be Pan America. The same, that's why oral language is so important. It's easy to teach the 26 letters and 44 phonemes. It's not easy to teach the uh, million and a half words. So these are the rules of decoding. You learn the sound symbol correspondence. You read from left to right, sounding out as you go. You overpronounce like insurance instead of insurance. If you overpronounce, you will get very close. And then you just note and remember the tricky part. Like this word, bagel. Let's sound it out. How many parts are in the word bagel? Bagel. Ba Two. Two parts. Okay. So, big is not hard. What are the three sounds? B, E, G. Easy stuff. What about that ending? I think oh. it should be L-E, but it's not. It's E-L. How did that happen? That's the tricky part. And you put a line, you remember it. You can put a line under it, whatever you do, but you don't have to remember the whole word. You just have to remember the tricky parts. And spelling is based on sounds. We did this last time. Kids, if they read a lot, if they have good phonics, they will start to recognize all these patterns like read, bead, peek, sneak, lead, dream. And then of course, there's some exceptions like red and steak. But this is the secret. Once your kids know how to read, just get them to read a lot and not hard books, books that they like, Books that they can read, very important. And one more thing, uh, we did this counting the syllables. Uh, dictation, we're not gonna do, I did it last time. We're gonna talk about fluency. The most important thing is that your kids read the words accurately. And so if your child is reading out loud to you, he should have just about every word done. He should, if he's on the right level, be able to read quickly. And he should also be able to read with expression. You know your kid is understanding it if it sounds like speech, right? And then comprehension, just as one major question, what's going on here, what you just read? And a little summary, that's all you need. And the same with silent reading to see what happens. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Good readers get better and better and better. And poor readers learn to hate reading and they never do it. And so the good readers who start here, the good readers go there and the poor readers go there. So we have to really get the kids to read. 
Okay, this is the last thing for fluency and then I'll take questions. If you're reading with your child, an easy book that he likes, he or she likes, and that you can read together, that your child can read, there are different types of reading. So one is choral reading, and we're going to practice this with this slide. And Jose is again going to be my student. So Jose, choral reading is that we read this slide together, starting with the title. Ready? All together. Practicing, Practicing fluency. fluency. At the same time, choral reading. Cor echo reading. Echo reading. At the same time, closed, closed reading. reading. Paired, paired reading. reading. Caption. And I told you to put the caption captions on television or film. What Jose was doing is echo reading. He was reading, I read it and then he read it. Choral reading is when you read it all together. Folks, and you choral, reading, choral reading will be much easier in person, folks, when you're not on a Zoom delay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> then, so we did choral reading, you just read together the same book, you can read it like together. Close reading, ha ha. Close reading is when you read and leave out a word and your child has to put in the word. So here we go, Jose, practicing. Reading, oh, sorry. One more time, Lavinia, <laughs> I couldn't hear the, the explanation. What is uh, okay. close reading? Close reading is, I'm gonna leave out words and you have to put them in. Okay. So we're starting at the top. Practicing. Fluency. Choral. Reading. Echo reading. Reading. A close. Okay, I said echo reading. What comes next? Close. Reading. Paired. Head reading. Captions on. Television or films. Obviously, that is a little bit more sophisticated. And then paired reading is just, we alternate. So if you have a book, I read one page, you read the other page, but it has to be a book that your child can read. So anyway, that is a way of practicing fluency. And the captions on the television, we talked about this. Just stick the captions on the television. Your kid's eyes cannot go off the television screen. It's impossible. And they will be reading what they hear. They will be making the, con the connection between speech and what they see and print. Okay, so this is all research on the power of reading. Anything, 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 20 minutes a night, anything, as long as they can read it. Sitting for 20 minutes a night with a book you can't read is torture and it does no good. And then here's an assignment for next month. To develop oral fluency, you can, there are songs, poems, nursery rhymes, tongue twisters. So dredge up your memory for these and between now and next month, do some of this with your kids. And then back to the five pillars of reading. Next month, we're gonna do vocabulary and comprehension. And if your kids have serious problems with print or any of these things, they may benefit from assistive technology where they can dictate into a device and the device will write to them. And it's not embarrassing. My husband is a very good reader, but he dicta he's a lawyer. He dictates wills into his device. Uh, you know, it's, it's something that you can do. And also there are devices that will read whatever it is back to you. A and so we are having a webinar on that on April 13th. Please tune in. And this is a motto. You think it's a talent? You think you're born with these things? I found out. And what I believed is that everybody is talented. It's just that some people get it developed and some don't. And that's the great Stephen Sondheim. 
So you are going to make sure that your kids' talents get developed by you, by the teachers, and by everyone in your child's world. So now I think uh, the key takeaway, you did this, language is a code. And our next session is March 9th at 7.30. Remember, nursery rhymes, tongue twisters, songs, between now and then, you'll get your kids' ears all perked up. Um, I think I can take some questions. Yes, we got some questions for you. And I, and I got to tell you, Lavinia, anyone who says this is easy stuff, listen, if if I can get stumped on closed reading, uh, <laughs> these should be challenging for, for even our teenagers to, to do <laughs> and good refreshers. Um, so we have but a couple can, of... Uh, the thing is, so say once you do it a few times, kids are faster than adults and they get it and they like to do it. Absolutely. Um, so we do have a couple of questions in here. And so we're going to go. Um, someone's asking here about um, help for left handed kids on, on good pencil grasping and posture. And I think you mentioned it earlier that, that, that folks can just Google. Yeah, they have videos, they have, you know, charts, and you still want your kid to sit up as straight as possible and not lie on the paper. And there are ways to get left-handed left kids to do it. Many more kids are left-handed now. And so people are addressing the problem in more uh, sympathetic ways. There's another question in here, which uh, is funny because we just talked about this, but how can uh, phonemes be worked upon with upper elementary levels? And like I was saying, like I was just stumped with this. So you can see, it sounds like you can start with the basics, right? And then move accordingly to what your child needs, right? Right. Um, you, If you turn things into games, I mean, there's research that human beings learn best three ways, by socializing, through games, and through storytelling. And that's what we're going to do next time and the last time. So if you can turn whatever it is into a game, uh, then they'll do it. There are games on the internet but be careful because you want it to be just right for your kid. Uh, and, you know, like go fast. That's what I've learned as a teacher. And also I supervise um, students and beginning teachers for Hunter College. And I keep saying, speed up. These kids are dying of boredom. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, if you go fast and if you have, uh, you can look up uh, reading games, but get the, you know your kids, get the ones that are just right for your kid. And if it causes conflict, get rid of the game. The game is to serve your kid. Your kid is not supposed to serve the game. Uh, so what do you do when, when a child makes a mistake? Uh, what's the proper way to correct them? Or do you have any thoughts on that? I do. First of all, that's the reason for pens and not pencils. You just say, everybody makes mistakes, cross it out and write the right answer on top of it. If you have a dry erase board, which you may want to buy, you just get rid of the mistake with a tissue, right? Gone. Uh, or if you're with keyboarding, you just get rid of the mistake, gone. But uh, in terms of pronunciation, uh, just correct kids. Uh, like if, if your child is saying whiff and writes whiff, you know, it's not a phonics problem. It's a pronunciation problem. If you teach your child to say whiff, that problem will be solved. But just model. And one of the things I know from being a teacher is don't say don't. Like, don't say whiff because you're reinforcing whiff you just say say whiff and that's that i, I hope that's an i mean you mm -hmm. know there are that's a simple answer to a simple problem but there are more complex problems but just everybody makes mistakes just cross it out and move on you got to this a little bit, um, but folks are asking if you have any thoughts or opinions on assistive technology for children with fine motor issues um, or that may struggle with writing. Uh, and 
is uh, is there preferable practices, um, maybe combining some assistive technology with some handwriting? Any thoughts on that? I think, I mean, I think it's really important for kids to know how to write uh, quickly, unless they are truly impaired. Uh, handwriting has kind of been purged from uh, most of, you know, early childhood instruction, or it's made, uh, kids are made to do it too early. So they develop bad habits. So whatever you can do to help them to hold their pencil correctly, sit up straight. But there are many uh, assistive technology uh, programs for free. Uh, you don't have to buy anything. And so definitely tune in on April 13th because that will be a whole session on assistive technology. Again, they will tell you what I told you. You make the assistive technology fit your child. You don't make your child fit the assistive technology. And so I would encourage you to do both. And when your kid, I mean, when kids are really young, it's very easy to change their habits because handwriting was never taught until first grade and it is not taught around the world until first grade. Now, if you have kids practicing very bad handwriting habits in fifth and sixth grade, keyboarding, I think, is the way to go. And Lavinia, there's one final question in here tonight and the, oh, there's a couple more actually. Um, but one of them is, um, have you ever come across uh, children who can learn to write but not read? Uh, yes. Um, and basically you have to trap them and trap them and say, oh, what did you do today? I went to the movies. You said it, you can write it down. And one of the things that I will tell you, people say writing is the hardest skill. I don't find that. I am sort of bilingual. English is my first and best language. I have studied a lot of Spanish and practiced a lot of Spanish, but I am much more comfortable writing in Spanish than reading Neruda's poetry. Uh, because when I write, I am in control of my words. When I'm reading, I have to deal with somebody else's words. So, um, I mean, those are things that you know you have to communicate. You're writing, so you want to communicate with somebody else. Reading, somebody wrote this to communicate with you. But again, you want to get them reading stuff that they can read. And there are decodable books. There are all different kinds of books. We can talk about that at the next session. But you build confidence by enabling kids to start where they are. You don't start, start teaching skiing at the top of Mount Everest and say, go to it kids, or teach your little friends. You start at the bottom of the hill with explicit instruction and lots of correct practice. All right, we're, we're a little over time, but there's two more questions that I wanna to get to. Um, so there's a question here on, should a person focus on just lowercase or uppercase? or combine them when, when first starting out? Well, 95% of prints is lowercase. So, um, you know, that's probably the best place to start, but you definitely want kids to know how to make capitals because they are necessary too. But uh, the lowercase letters are also easier to make in one stroke. Like you don't have to pick up your finger. You can, I'm using my finger. Like a is one stroke, b, k, d, e. Whereas the capitals, you often have to pick up your pencil and you might get confused in terms of which direction you're going. And then the last question, which I think is an interesting question. You just, you just said about uh, writing being taught to first graders all over the world. Um, what kind of work can parents do with their kindergartners? Uh, the best thing to do with kindergartners is you can teach basic letter formation when they're ready. 
but also you want to really beef up their oral language. The more you can beef up their oral language and the more phonological awareness is essential in kindergarten because then when you ask them to write a letter, when you ask them to write the symbol for a sound, they'll know what you're talking about. And as you saw from Jose, I have to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tattle on him. Jose practiced that <laughs> phonological awareness drill. It's not so easy. And if you can do that, and those drills are on the internet, and David A. Kilpatrick is a master of doing that. So that I think is very important. But if you want to do something, get one of those, uh, make sure you teach your child to do it right from the beginning. And hold the pencil with the pencil grip that is most efficient. Writing with this pencil grip is efficient and it will lead to automaticity so that when your child is ready to write the great American novel, he'll be able to do it quickly and not say, oh, I'm so tired. Oh. So anyway, thank you for listening and I'll see you next month. Yeah, thanks again, Lavinia. We really appreciate uh, you being here and doing another session with us. And yes, we're excited to see you again uh, for next month. Uh, folks, thank you again for sticking around and sticking past 8.30. We will see you all next week when we return with Dr. Schoenfeld to have our second session of our social emotional learning track. So until then, stay safe everyone and have a great night. And keep talking. Ha, 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 ha.